This is Chapter 3, Key Issue 1. The learning goal would be that students would be able to describe why and how people migrate and the typical characteristics of migrants according to E.G. Ravenstein's Laws of Migration. There's a lot of concepts to know, so here's the list. Migration, immigration, emigration with an E, mobility, circulation, which is cyclical seasonal movement, and specifically transhumance, push-pull factors of migration, the three types, refugees, internal versus international refugees, intervening obstacles, or you could say intervening opportunities, internal versus international migration, internal interregional versus intra-regional, voluntary versus forced migration, migration streams and counter streams, step migration, gravity model as it relates to migration, Wilbur Zelensky's migration transition stages as they relate to the demographic transition model, characteristics of migrants according to Ravenstein and remittances. So in the book, it gave several of Ravenstein's migration laws, which he put together in 1885. So that's a long time ago, but some of them still apply. And the ones that are highlighted in yellow and italicized uh, font is what you need to focus on. So migration is usually over a short distance and often occurs in steps. Any kind of long-range migration is movement to large urban areas of large population. Migrations produce a stream and a counter stream. That is that people move um, back and forth between the same place. Um, males are more migratory over long distances. Most migrants are adults and most people move because of economic reasons. Here's some key terms. Migration is a permanent movement to a new location. It is a form of relocation diffusion. Immigrant with an I is a migrant who enters a country. Think of um, in, coming in a country. Emigration with an E is a migrant who leaves a country. Think E for exit. Net migration is the immigrants, people who are coming into the country, minus um, emigrants with an E, the people who are leaving the country. So a positive net migration means that there are more people entering a country than leaving. Mobility is a general term for movement. It doesn't have to be permanent. It's when you go to school um, every day or you drive to the grocery store. That's movement. It's not a permanent place. You don't go there to stay. Circulation is also called cyclical migration or seasonal migration. This is repetitive or short-term movements on a regular basis. Say you go to a certain spot um, vacation every year, so you go back there every year. Or college students go between college and their home during um, you know, cyclical fall and then coming back at the end of spring and, and so forth. Transhumance is a form of cyclical seasonal mobility uh, movement. This is when nomadic herders travel with their animals, their sheep, or their goats, or camels, and they travel looking for food and water. And they usually go um, to one place during a certain season, such as maybe the highlands, during the summer season when it's not so cold, and they have their animals graze up in the highlands. And then when it gets really cold and the snow comes, they'll move down to the lowlands during the winter months where there's, there's grass. So there are push and pull factors that are the reasons why people move. Push factors are factors that um, almost like want to boot you out of your out of your place. They want to um, um, discourage you from living there anymore. So you want to. They're kind of negative things that would push you away from um, where you are. And then pull factors lure you to the place. It's uh, more of a positive um, lure. So there are economic push and pull factors, and you can see a list here. These have to do with economies such as jobs, um, you know, not something to do with money, uh, not be able to make a good living, um, lack of uh, medical care that would allow you to, you know, earn a good living or the cost of it. Education would be a part of this. 
So these are economic having to do with money, push and pull factors. Cultural factors, whether they're push or pull, has more to do with people and their choices or the political system or their religious beliefs or language. Um, so these are cultural factors. Now, political factors would be under cultural factors. So these would be examples of some political push factors that would encourage people to leave, such as a war, um, political instability because of the government is um, a repressive government. Maybe there's newly drawn political boundaries and the ethnic group that you um, relate to now has is on the other side of that boundary, so you would move to join your ethnic group. Uh, you could be forced to move because of your race or your religion or you're just not a part of the, the political social group that's in favor, and so you feel um, that you are being persecuted. This would be a, a refugee that needs to flee because of this persecution and you don't feel safe. Um, other push factors, cultural push factors, we, we talked about religion, religious persecution, uh, bullying of any kind, maybe you can't find a mate. So these will all be push, cultural push factors. Specifically looking at refugees, like I said, there are, these people are forced to leave um, because they are in fear for their safety, and it is impossible for them to reloc uh, to return. So often they are dislocated, um, maybe for years, maybe forever. And as of 2005, there were 33 million refugees throughout the year. 12 million of these were international; they were forced outside of their country, and then 21 million were internal, so they were forced from their home and then just had to move to another region within their country. The two uh, largest groups, um, according to Rubenstein, would be, as far as two largest international refugee groups, would be the Palestinians, who, um, since 1948, you can see here in Israel, where my cursor is, Israel were forced out of Israel since 1948 and have lived um, in neighboring countries like Lebanon to the north and Syria and Jordan and even into Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. So the Palestinians would be an international, and then the Afghans, so this is also in, in Asia, you can see Afghan here between um, Iran and Pakistan, and um, since um, in the 1970s and into the 1980s there was war with the Soviet Union, um, that was a country at that time, communist country, and they invaded Afghan. Afghanistan and there caused a lot of people to leave their country. And then the 21 million international or internal refugees, the largest would be uh, Sudan. Um, Sudan until 2011 was one country. You can see right here, this right here is Sudan. And actually it has split into northern Sudan and southern Sudan largely because of the civil war and violence between the northern Muslim Arabic um, controlled government from the north and the southern um, Christian African tribes in the south. And then Colombia would be another um, group of people or area where there's a lot of migration within their country, largely because of the drug violence um, and conflict with, with government. Cultural pull factors would, like I said, lure people to another place. And so some examples would be, uh, a, like a political uh, pull factor, would be during the Cold War um, when Germany's uh, Berlin, city of Berlin, was split in half with an eastern and western Berlin. East was communism and west was democracy. And you can see this picture of the wall here and people from eastern Berlin wanted to leave and they were lured by the, the freedom in West Berlin. Um, other cultural pull factors would be that you might want to just go and you want to live somewhere where your ethnic community is so that you could find a mate or you just want to go someplace that's beautiful to live in. Not so much the environment, because we'll get to that, but uh, maybe the, the sites, the recreational activities that are there, beautiful museums or monuments. 
so that also would be a cultural pull factor. Environmental push factors, uh, water is, would be the most common uh, push and even pull factor. And you can see these pictures either having too much water where you have a flood or a hurricane um, that would cause you to want to leave um, your area or lack of water would also want you to leave your areas. So the picture below is a picture of the Dust Bowl of the 1930s in Oklahoma. Other environmental push factors would be things like hurricanes or tornadoes or maybe you just can't live where it's too cold or it's too dry or you have allergies or lack of arable land, so anything that has to do with the environment. Environmental pull factors would be lures of a beautiful environment that you just want to go and live in, like the Swiss Alps, the Mediterranean coast, and then you know, Florida coast. Beautiful scenery and climate. Intervening obstacles or opportunities are factors that would hinder or stop or disrupt the, the migration from being completed. Obstacles are viewed more as a negative factor. Opportunities are viewed as more of a positive factor. Something better comes along that prevents you from completing your migration. So some of these intervening obstacles or opportunities would be economic. You um, all of a sudden have, you, you run out of money to get to where you're going. Um, cultural would be maybe there's a block as far as there's a language barrier so you cannot communicate and move on. Maybe there's uh, government policies, you don't have a visa that doesn't allow you to get to where you're going or you don't have a passport or there's a quota which is where a government has a certain amount of people that they will accept into their country and when the government matches, maxes out on their quota then they don't allow anybody else in. So these would be cultural, or political, um, obstacles that would prevent you from completing your migration. A physical environment might be a mountain for you to cross or a desert to cross a large body of water. Our modern transportation diminishes this influence of environmental obstacles, but there's, there still is. You can see the, the picture to the right. This is the desert um, in Mexico um, along the border of the United States, and that is an obstacle. Many people don't make it through that desert because of its harsh um, climate without water and very hot. An intervening opportunity would be such as getting a job along the way or meeting your soulmate and getting married and so you, you stop your migration. All right, Ravenstein has some ideas about the distance of migration, how far migration occurs. So most migration is short distances within a country. Many people move to a new house in another community, move to a new state or a new county. So most migrants actually, migration is a short distance within a country. If there is long distance uh, international migrants, um, then they usually go to a large urban area because of the economic activity there and get a good job. Migration stream, or you can call this a migration flow, versus a migration counter stream or counter flow. Here you see these arrows, and the size of the arrow represents how many migrants are moving. And these would be example of a counter a stream and a counter stream. You can see that they go back and forth. Um, so you can see from Texas to California and California back to Texas. People tend to um, migrate between places. So these are the migration stream and a migration counter stream as they go back and forth. Um, regarding distance of migration, step migration is where you would migrate, um, especially to a long distance place, and often it, it uh, takes a little bit at a time. You don't get there all at once. So the migration happens, but one step at a time, one stage at a time, not all at once. So somebody from a rural area might move to a small village, then to a larger city, and then to maybe even a larger city. So that's what step migration is. The distance of migration is affected by uh, the gravity model. And the gravity model has, is two-pronged, in a sense. There's two things dealing with the gravity model. There is a complicated formula, and you don't need to understand it, don't need to know it, but um, you should know these two parts of the gravity model. It has to do with spatial interaction between places, how places are interacting with each other. Places that are closer together are going to have a strong interaction, a strong connection between them, 
and this idea of distance decay, the further those two places are apart, the less interaction there will be between those two places. And places that are larger in population have a greater spatial interaction between each other. You can think about this with magnets. If you play with magnets, the closer those two magnets together, you can see there's a stronger attraction and they'll want to pull together. And the further you get those magnets away from each other, then that, that connection or that attraction diminishes. So that's kind of like the first one. Um, places are closer together, they have a stronger spatial interaction. The second one, think about having like a large magnet. Um, if you have a, a large magnet and um, a smaller magnet, and then you know another neutral magnet, your magnet would be more attracted to the larger magnet than it would be to the smaller magnet. And that's the same with migration. People tend to migrate closer distances, and if they do migrate a long distance, they will go to a larger urban population. So you can see below here, so spatial interaction is, number one, goes with the closer together, they are inversely related to distance. So the greater the distance, the less the interaction. This is an inverse relationship. So I have a little visual down below. So we have two places close together. You can see here, these two places close together, there is a strong rela re reaction. So this is the shorter the distance, the greater the interaction. This is the opposite effect, all right? And then you have places that are further apart. The greater the distance, the less the interaction. So you can see this is a weaker link. It's a thinner line. And then the second one that has to do with the population size, you could say spatial interaction regarding the gravity model is directly related to population size. So the greater the size, the greater the interaction. This is a direct relationship. This one over here, the inverse relation to distance. Again, this is an inverse or kind of like opposite. So greater distance, less reaction or less interaction. So that's the gravity model. And it has to do with distance and migration. Internal migration. This is when the people migrate within a country. So this might be um, inter-regional migration, which is between regions. Think about you inter one region and then go, uh, you're in one region and you inter another region. This might be from state to state from a rural region to an urban region, that would be urbanization as you go to the urban area, or from the urban to the rural. These are two different types of regions. That would be called counter-urbanization, as in the opposite of urbanization. Or you might see it as ex-urbanization, like you're exiting um, the urbanized area, the exit urbanization, the opposite of urbanization. Intra-regional, with an A here, intra-regional is migration within a country, but within a region, within a region. So this is usually talked about within urban areas. So it might be from the city to the suburbs. So let's say you live in this high-rise apartment building inside the city in the urban area, and you want to move out to the suburbs where there's communities and neighborhoods and neighborhood schools. So you still stay in the urban area, but you're just moving out to the suburbs, which is considered part of an urban area. So this would be suburbanization. Or you might move from one neighborhood to an, another neighborhood still in the urban area. That would be intra-regional migration. So inter-regional, between regions, intra-regional, within a region. These are both internal migration movement within a country. International migration is between countries. You leave your country and you go to another country. This might be voluntary migration where you choose to make that move or forced migration where you basically are forced to move. Um, somebody else is making that decision for you and you have to move. Either um, you are you know, in fear of your, your life like a refugee or something like slavery. 
Um, so slavery would be forced, migration, uh, refugees due to those political uh, problems that would force them out. Uh, military conscription, you are you join the military, so the fact that you are with the military and you move to another place and you live there, then that would be a, for, a term of forced migration. Children of migrants, if your parents move and kids have to go with their parents, and you know basically they are forced to move because they have no choice. Maybe a situation of divorce or separation, the parents split up and you have to go with one parent and you move and again that's not a choice that the child is making. So that is forced migration. All right, then there, within distance of migration, there is Wilbur Zelensky's migration transition stages, and these go along with the demographic transition migration. These are typical patterns that you would find um, within society, um, specifically different uh, migrational patterns due to social or economic changes within the society. So stage one would happen during the demographic stage one. You can see here where there's high crude birth rate, high crude death rate. This is before any kind of industrial um, revolution or a medical revolution and many, many people die. And this is really before, you know, civilized societies. So the kind of migration that happened um, during stage one would be kind of a circular seasonal migration, transhuman. People moving along with their families looking for, and um, animals looking for food for themselves and, and for their animals. So they would just migrate kind of seasonally. That would be stage one. Stage two, think about this is um, when a country grows in population because of the death rate declining. And we looked at two different uh, groups of countries that went through their stage two. You look at Europe and North America, Australia went through their stage two because of the Industrial Revolution, and then countries in like Asia, Latin America, and Africa went through their stage two, or still currently in stage two, because of the medical revolution. So there's two different types of migration that would be typical in a stage two demographic transition stage. International migration is, is typical. Because your country becomes so crowded because of the overpopulation, there's so many people, you want to leave your country because maybe you can't find work, um, so you leave the country. So that would be international migration. But you could also stay in your country, but often typically in a stage two, the internal migration within your country would be interregional. So often you're going from the rural area, you used to be working on a farm, moving to the urban area looking for a job, maybe in a factory. And so here's a chart that shows over time um, China's rural to urban migration has increased um, since 1990 to 2000, um, you know, and expected into 2015, 20, and 25. So you see the estimated urban population, the red, um, as the o total population of 15 to 59 year olds who are people who are in their working years, you see the red population bar is increasing and that is that urban migration as people move from the rural areas to the urban. Stage three uh, migration transition stages would, stage three, four, and five would all be internal migration. So people are not leaving their country because their country's you know, doing really well, starting to really economically develop, and is internal but intra-regional. They might just be moving from an urban to a suburb or suburb to urban because of their lifestyle changes. They are not moving too far. They're staying kind of within their community, just finding a, a bigger house. All right, and then the last section uh, was characteristics of migrants. Ravenstein says that most long-distance migrants are males. Um, up until the 1990s, 55% of U.S. immigrants were males. These are long distance, so people coming from a country outside to the United States. So you can see this um, picture of migrants in the early 1900s, mostly male. But that trend is starting to change now. So now, 55% are women. You can see here, this is more typical um, of today, immigrant workers often working in a food manufacturing plants many of them women. Um, also, as far as c characteristics of migrants, according to Ravenstein, is that most long-distance migrants are adult individuals. 
rather than families with children. Uh, 40% of migrants are 25 to 39 year olds compared to 23% of the entire U.S. population. So that means that most of that working age, um, that the fact that that's increased um, to 40% for migrants versus 23, that more people are adults who are coming and looking for work. However, we see more children are coming with their mothers as um, the economic situation is desperate. And the Rubenstein's text, dis text discussed characteristics of undocumented immigrants from Mexico. Um, they're usually uneducated, often work in agriculture um, as migrant workers um, moving from farm to farm, depending on the season of the, the crops. They often settle in the southwest United States, which is close to Mexico, that short distance migration from Mexico into Arizona and California and Texas and New Mexico. And American businesses like to hire undocumented immigrants because they can pay them less because they're not part of the system and often they deport them when, when they want. They're not behaving. Remittances, um, that would be appropriate to talk about this now, remittances are the money earned by immigrants that is sent back to their home country. So lots and lots of money, millions of dollars, um, is sent back to home countries through immigrants. So that concludes.